Here I am in Cache in Switzerland and this is where my adventure starts. We want to witness and analyze how the Warner Glacier is shrinking. And why would an astronaut be going on, a, on an expedition like this? What does an astronaut have to do with the glacier? Well, it just so happened that when I was in orbit on the ISS, I took many, many pictures. And over the arc of about six years, from the first mission to the second, I saw with my own eyes the glacier slowly disappearing. It struck me. And so uh, this group of scientists and climatologists asked me to, uh, to come here and see it with my own eyes on the ground what I'd seen from space. Frank, I'm here for the very first time uh, and it is a very unique environment to be. Certainly. And, and a very unusual one for, for an astronaut. Tell me a little bit, what, what am I looking at? Um, yeah, we are, we are here uh, in the beautiful um, Zermatt region. We are surrounded by the highest mountains we have in Switzerland. So it's actually the uh, peak behind us is um, the highest mountain in Switzerland. And um, um, we have these beautiful glaciers. Glaciers are, are living things. They, they, change, uh, they change with time, they change with, uh, with climate, and they change with meteorological conditions as well. What is the story that the Gorner is going to tell us in the next couple of days? Uh, here we are in a very special place because um, all, all glaciers are composed of uh, compressed snow. So this is not frozen water. And um, this, the snow that um, is the source of this glacier comes from the highest elevations up there at uh, Dufurspitze. And at this elevation, it is so cold that there's basically no melt all over the year which means that um, the snow by the uh, la la layers from uh, further years is compacted more and more and more without melting. We uh, name this uh, yeah, so somehow a dry recrystallization, which is the same process as in Greenland, for example. Okay. And this does only take place here and um, has a special, uh, say, um, consequence um, that a part of uh, the ice that we see down there at uh, Gorner Glacier is so-called cold ice. So it is below zero degrees. It is not um, as all the other ice at the uh, so-called pressure melting point. That means um, when you put some energy into the other ice or some pressure, um, the ice would melt. And this is not the case here for this uh, central part. It appears also very white here in uh, this case um, 
The uh, white eyes is also a little bit uh, self-protecting because it is so bright, it reflects more of the sunlight so that in the end um, the melt should not be so strong as for the darker grayer eyes. And here this glacier or this central part of the glacier with, with, with the cold ice um, is really unique and um, uh, the core of many, many studies. One of the things that, 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 that uh, meteorologists and geophysicists study is also the ongoing changes in global climate. Is it something that is affecting this glacier as well? Yeah, the, uh, the global increase in temperatures is affecting, global warming. Uh, yeah, is affecting all glaciers all over the world in exactly the same way. Thanks to the satellite data, um, uh, a recently um, published study has shown that this meltdown of the glaciers is really all over the world. So, and it has also accelerated all over the world. And this is a little bit, um, let's say, the worst side of it because um, glaciers adjust to the climate um, by um, changing their size. <laughs> it is a, a, a truly humbling experience to be up here in the beautiful setting of, of the Swiss Alps. Uh, I have only seen these uh, images from space. I have taken many, many pictures of the lo these locations and what is happening here. And to actually see with my own eyes and feel under my feet uh, the rocks of the Swiss Alps, it, it, it's amazing. It's almost unbelievable. And now I've been up for 12 hours. I have eaten a couple of granola bars during the day. I've hiked for five hours, so I'm hungry and I'm ready to go eat something.
looked at a couple of things. First we found uh, Mulan. Uh, it's a shaft where water, melt, melt water converges from, uh, from river systems that are formed by uh, the melting of the glacier and then they go into, into the ice and, and melt it creating this, this shaft and the images are amazing. It, it's beautiful although it is a sign of something terrible happening, again, the melt of the glacier. And then once it goes underneath the glacier, it just flows towards the valley. We have a that has the name, as you said, the Mulino. There are many in the glacier. And I can tell you that the number is increasing. E soprattutto la quantità di acqua. Adesso noi stiamo vedendo una Vedier, per questo ruscello, prende il nome di Vedier, che è molto piccolo, ma in realtà ce ne sono tantissime e sono diffuse in tutto il ghiacciaio. Questo ci dice che la maggior parte dell'acqua di fusione poi finisce nel cuore del ghiacciaio e da qualche parte trova una via per fluire verso Valle. For monitoring glaciers, we use uh, different tools and that depends very much on the scale that we are monitoring. For example, we do assessment of uh, glacier changes all across the Earth and they are very much focused uh, or based on remote sensing observations. So satellites that look at Earth either visually, so with pictures, or through radar or through altimeters, so a range of tools. Um, for the monitoring of Swiss glaciers, we also have in situ observations, so measurements that are done at the very site. What you're holding there, uh, it's a, what we call an ablation pole, an ablation stick. So it's a, um, a device, it's maybe a bit exaggerated, but it's a pole that will stick in the ice with, uh, with drill and uh, we'll use that to tell how much the glacier is melting. And uh, well, if you want, you could uh, do the job yourself sure. and I will show you. So I'm sure you know how to operate the drill. Just make sure when you start, uh, make a little hole on it, mm -hmm. and then try to um, have it's it as straight. straight as possible, okay. otherwise it will bend. And while- I'll do down, my best. I've never, I never drilled a hole in the ice, yeah. but- uh, Try to, yeah, exactly, hold the hand there. That will give you control. And whilst you're going down, come up a bit. Yeah, exactly, so that you get rid of the, of this, uh, um, yeah, pieces of ice that we are drilling through. That's it. Okay. Um, and now... Put this one down or you want to hold it? Uh, we can put that away. But yeah, you can get the ablation tool again. Okay, so the ablation, ablation is just a scientific wo uh, word for melt, for melting. Yeah, correctly. So um, what, what we distinguish in the glacier cases is uh, ablation, so the process that removes mass from, uh, from the glacier. And here the main process is the melt. Okay. And accumulation, that would be the process by which we add mass to the So mountain. when it snows and it covers everything with snow. Exactly. And then eventually that pressure from the snow will create new ice. Hopefully. That's correct, yeah. This is something that doesn't happen in this very place because here we are in what we call the ablation zone. So it's the zone on the glacier where we lose more ice to melt during summer that we can add uh, to um, snowfall during winter. Whilst higher up, so in the regions that we see up there, uh, there we are in the accumulation zone. So there we gain more snow during the year than we can lose during summer through melt. So this is an important part that um, really explains the dynamic of a glacier. So let's, let, let's say that again in common, in common words that even an astronaut can understand. So basically this is like a river. It's flowing down from the place up there in the mountains where 
During winter, it snows, it accumulates, it creates a lot of ice, and then eventually flows out down here. Here, we don't, have, we don't really get more ice. We just get whatever it, it's coming down from the mountain. And during the summer, it, we, just, we get this ablation process, which is the melting of the ice. That creates a lot of water, rivers that go down to the valley. You got it. Did yeah. I say it pretty much okay? Yeah, exactly. Excellent. What, and this, then this flow is uh, what is happening there, is the ice deforming underneath its own weight. So you can imagine like a slab where you would put some honey on it. Uh, this will kind of make its way down. And the, the uh, glaciers, as you said, it, do exactly the same. So they make down the valleys by uh, deforming themselves. Why don't we go ahead uh, here? For that, you have the three poles. It has been easier to do that with that this way. And the ball we have put here will... So what we have here is the camera that we'll, we'll place to look at this uh, worry spot. Okay. And during the day, while the melt is happening, this will lower. And so what you will see is basically this uh, ring sliding down the way. Okay. And uh, well, in a bright day like this, at this elevation, we may see like uh, five to 10 centimeters, so something like of melt. So when we come back uh, in the evening, but basically we are not walking over the same ice again, uh, because it will have molten um, by then already. So this all part of the glacier is melting at the same speed, and that's about 10 centimeters a day on a hot day. On a very hot day, yeah. On exactly. a very hot day. So let's say five to 10 centimeters per day on average over the summer. So how much of this will have melted compared to the, from the beginning of the season to the end? How much ice will, have, will we have lost? At the place where we stand, I would guess um, three meters. Three meters. So that's putting myself on top of your shoulders, that uh, more or less, but uh, if I sit on you, uh, that, that's the amount of ice we lose every year here. Every year we lose three meters of ice. Now, this is the question that's been burning me. Will we recover any of that in the, in, in the next year, in the next winter? Will we recover any of that ice? Well, unfortunately not, because uh, indeed during winter we will have snowfall here. So uh, when we are here in winter, you, you may have like up to four meters of snow. Uh, but this will go and melt away again at the, um, at the next year. So we'll find the ice that will leave during winter. We have a bit of new ice coming in, that's the one flowing down the mountain. But in that time, the stake will have moved. So the, 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 the ice that falls down is kind of pushing our stake away. And so the answer to your question is basically no, unfortunately, we, we, we won't grow the glacier during winter. three stark issues that are associated with glacier retreat. So on the one hand we have a change in the hydrological system, so, so we get a lot of runoff, um, there, are, there are lakes that build in front of our mountain glaciers, um, and these can cause hazards, so, so there can be dams that break and flash flooding that happens, so we have an, also an increase in hazards in the mountain areas. Um, or when there is less ice, the mountain also, the forces are differently distributed on the mountain. Um, so we may have more rock falls and, and uh, the, the hazard zones are actually expanding. Then we also have the issue that uh, when we lose ice, it flows into the ocean and glaciers actually contribute to a global mean sea level rise and they contribute quite a lot. So um, from a climate perspective that is, that is a worrying aspect as well. There is a system of caves, they are contact caves, it means that the glacier is touching the rock and then um, the water plus the the hot air from the outside mixed together to create these uh, incredible structures that are underneath the glacier. Unfortunately, despite their beauty, this also means that the, 
the roof of the glacier is getting thinner because of the hot air and it is another sign that a few years from now what I'm looking at today will not exist anymore. Probably next year the cave where I was that I was in will not be there. The, the roof of the of the glacier will be so thin that it will collapse and then when I was standing under the ice it will be just bare rock. Fenomeni come questi stanno accelerando, cioè l'acqua che arriva da di lato sta entrando sotto il ghiacciaio e sta creando dei vuoti. Ma siccome ci sono più ingressi, c'è una circolazione d'aria e di conseguenza hai acqua più aria, quindi la fusione è aumentata anche dalla circolazione d'aria. Ecco perché sta accelerando tutto questo processo. So we are looking at different aspects of a glacier, for example, with different sensors that can give us different uh, parameters of this particular natural phenomena that we are actually looking at. So that's actually quite interesting and we need to have long-term data series to actually understand how the climate is changing over decades, for example, and to also understand what the trend of these changes are going to be. And uh, satellite data are a great source for all this. Here we are at the FIA Experience. It's the place in the European Space Agency Center in Rome, the Center for its Observation, where we display the work we do with satellites. And here you see the Arctic sea ice extent. And the Arctic extent, as you can see here, is monitored via satellites day and night, uh, via radar instruments and via altimeters. And this is over 40 years of time that we have data. And normally we look at the lowest extent of the ice, which is in September. And in September, this is the time where you have a real reduction of the ice mass over the Arctic. And we do plan to have, by 2050, unfortunately, an ice-free Arctic during the summertime. We do look at sea level rise since over 30 years with national European American missions. And we look at the trend of the sea level rise. Sea level rise, which is due to, of course, temperature increase, but also ice uh, melting all over the world. We see the variability of such uh, sea level rise, which is not homogeneous, and we see that the trend is passing from an average yearly of 3.2 millimeters to 4.8 millimeters per year increase in the sea level rise. And in the next station, we will look at applications which are related to the use of the land. So we look at forest, and we will look also at the quality of the air and the things which are very important for our daily lives. We see here the situation of the vegetation of uh, the tropical forest in Brazil in 2018 and the biomass uh, situation. And we compare that with previous years through satellite data. We look with radar, we look with optical data, and we look at deforestation, which is of course very relevant when you look, for example, at CO2 impact and also fires. And over various years, you can compare the evolution over a specific region of such uh, forest, and the evolution of such forest can also be monitored through future satellites that we're preparing, like the biomass one. Here we look at uh, Sentinel-5P data, greenhouse gases data. Uh, nitrogen dioxide over Europe, but this is a satellite that passes every day over all of the world, and we see the variability between week and weekends. So the difference is very relevant. It's due to traffic reduction and reduction in industrial activities. So satellites help us in climate change to monitor greenhouse gases, to monitor CO2, methane, nitrogen dioxide, and help us supporting the climate crisis. We are sort of thinking about the whole food chain from producing the data and building the satellite and developing new technology and uh, addressing new science questions to actually putting these satellites in space and then using these data and um, when they've flown long enough 
uh, we are able to actually construct a um, long-term series of uh, climate-relevant data. So we're using different sources, not only ESA, but mainly uh, to uh, create climate data records, we call. And these are um, relevant data sets that tell us something in how the climate is actually changing over decades and uh, even longer. Um, and, you know, with the onset of satellite data 40 plus years ago, we now really have quite some long data sets um, that go sometimes beyond 30, 40 years really from space, which is a very exciting uh, source of data. Now, with your experience in, in climate, do you, think, do, you, do you think that this is something that we can stop or even better reverse or is it just or is it something that you just hope i think if we are um, if we are managing to limit our uh, the global warming to a particular degree then we will probably be able to at least hold uh, the status quo that we have at the moment um, but you know there's a very difficult question is it's one it's, it's the sort of million dollar question so of to course. say um, so i can't really answer that with a yes or a straight no or something like this you know i hope we will and we have seen that with many countries that they are really starting to address it so you know actually i think we don't really have a choice we we have to limit our emissions if we don't do that then the destroying of our natural environment will continue I think it's quite iconically known that glaciers are melting and it's all associated with climate change. We, we know this, I mean we see it if we go into the Alps ourselves, we, we, we can see the signs, the markings where the glacier was um, over the past decade. Satellites actually show us this globally. So. It is actually a very recent development now with this program as well that we have been able to monitor um, our glaciers globally from space over a long period. And what we see is that there is a global nature of retreat of these glaciers and this is unprecedented and, and in fact it's, it's very worrying. If we now really manage to put effort in abating emissions, we will be able to save, say, at least 40% of the ice. So half of this place is gone anyway, uh, but still, there will be something that we can look at and that we can show to our children and that our children can show to our grandchildren. I think nature is sending here a very strong signal to us. I feel a little bit of urgency and because it's me, I also feel hope that people will listen and understand the urgency of what is happening and how fast we have to react before everything that we have will disappear. So there is a lot at stake and that is why this is now the time to act. Come on, buddy. I don't want to be rude, but you got to get going. Okay. <laughs>